The Immaculate Conception of Little Dizzle is a hilarious and surreal film from 2009 about men giving birth to little blue fish after consuming experimental self-heating cookies. That is, self-heating, not self-eating, which wouldn't be that cool. They're self-heating, so they're supposed to taste like they just got out of the oven. The film follows a young guy named Dory who loses his comfortable office job at the start and finds a new job as a janitor in a big office building. One company in the building, Corsica, is designing the new cookies and they test them out on the janitors who they know are eating them when they leave them out. The janitors eat them without knowing just how experimental they are and they get hooked on them, get pregnant, and give birth to fish out of their butts. And a lot of other stuff happens, since a lot of the important plot points of the film have nothing to do with the cookies. Like, the main character Dory is on a spiritual quest the whole time and tries out five different religions over the course of the film, unrelated to the cookies. Another main character, O.C., is the lead janitor, and he gets his big break as an artist and quits the job after getting a big financial boost, unrelated to the cookies, though the art project he then works on is inspired by a cookie-induced hallucination. The other two janitors, Methyl and Ethel, are in a relationship with each other and they go through a lot unrelated to the cookies, and yeah, their names are Methyl and Ethel. It's kind of a surreal film. The movie is a comedy, but it has ambitions well beyond that, which is part of why it played at Sundance Film Festival to a sold-out crowd, and why it remains one of the most interesting and original films I've ever seen. For instance, while it may just seem like a comedic satire of religion to have Dory cycle through these different faiths, making them seem interchangeable or making them all seem like they don't really help, the film is not really making fun of religion. Dory's flailing search for meaning says more about him and his society than about the religions he uses to try to learn and grow. Since the film has strong religious and spiritual themes, I thought it would be perfect to do an analysis of In Time for Christmas. I found this extremely long and detailed interview with the writer and director David Russo, and it was fascinating. This is where I learned a lot of interesting background to this cult classic. For instance, Russo shares, All the script doctors that we consulted in the four years of development really had a problem with that, that we never explained his religious hunger and why he's trying on religions. We don't explain it, we just watch him move through them. And it was really hard because you can't explain why some people are seekers and when you try it becomes stupid. You impose something dumb on the script when you try to explain spiritual hunger. I really like this. I, I'm a pretty spiritual person in some ways and I've definitely drawn from various religions in my life but I've never felt permanently drawn to one. I'm actually working on a video about this so yeah subscribe and stuff but like in a spiritual way. And as it turns out Russo has had similar life experience as he shared later in the same interview saying for every religion that I have dipped my toe in through the course of my own life I felt that same way I go in with my whole heart but it's still a trying on it's still something very foreign and it's as easy to take off as it is to put on in the film we meet Dory as he loses his job and we learn he's in a tight spot financially I'm drowning in debt I'm behind in rent the universe has just given a big F you to him and I don't mean him losing his job he he caused that himself by flipping out and destroying his annoying co-worker's cell phone in a scene that feels ripped from an office space fantasy. No, the universe saying F you to Dory happens just before he gets himself fired when he's reading a bible and eating a banana at the river in the opening scene. While he's sitting there he sees a message in a bottle and since he's the type to search for meaning of course he goes to get it. But then he slips and gets soaked breaks the bottle because he can't uncork it, and gets cut on a shard of glass, quickly starting to bleed. When he finally gets the message out of the bottle, here's what it says. This is one of my favorite opening scenes of any movie. What this scene tells me is that Dory's luck is bad. His relationship with fate is not in a good place. The world is cursing at him through messages in bottles, and not just that, but even shortly after, his overly loud and cheerfully annoying coworker seems also also like a blast of bad luck. And how does he handle his luck? Well, Dory at the start of the film is so lost and uncentered that in the face of bad luck he gets aggressive. 
The role of violent outbursts will come up at the end at a critical moment, and the movie does an explicit callback to this scene where he breaks his coworker's phone, so make note here of how his violence was, in this context, an overreaction and an irrational response. I'm going to challenge whether it would have been in the later example, but we have a lot else to talk about before that. So Dory gets himself fired, and as he leaves, a coworker gives him a business card for a janitorial business. Dory rides over on his cool motorcycle and applies to be a janitor in this big office building, getting hired on the spot by O.C. O.C. has, let's say, a lot of energy and a lot of ideas. He explains to Dory the role of the janitor. That, that's not true. And we're not here. The point is to not exist. Guy walks into his office, sees his trash, bloop, you exist. You screwed up. He's been reminded of his refuse. Boss gets a call, you know his radar. He emphasizes this a lot. So it's like the whole out of sight, out of mind thing. Yeah, if you're into cliches. The point is, from here on out, you're invisible. Dory, where the hell? That's what I'm talking about. Uh, oh, oh, that's, wow, that's a pretty creative way of looking at things. And luckily for Dory, who's at the start of a spiritual quest, O.C. is here to supply the philosophical ideas. He tells Dory about the mythological meanings of the word janitor. But it is from ancient mythology. Janus, as in the figure of Janus, as in January, the entry month of every year. You see, Janus is the custodian of the gateways, the gatekeeper. That's why he's always represented with a double face looking both ways. And you and I, young Dory, we are the janitors with a capital J. You see, there's a world in here. There's a world down there. And like Janus, we stand where these exits meet entrances. This kind of thing seems to satisfy Dory's need for personal meaning, or just kind of amaze him with such a powerful way of framing what many would view as a dirty or unpleasant business. Writer-director Russo actually was a janitor for 11 years, so that joy for janitorial sciences comes from a very real place. And all that stuff about the deeper meaning of the word janitor is completely true, by the way. It does actually come from the Latin word for gateway and all that, which I definitely did not assume the first time I watch this movie. When Dory asks if O.C.'s a philosopher, O.C. says, <laughs> I prefer artists, but whatever. Which sort of creates a broader concept of art than we might be used to. In that same interview with Russo, he says, O.C. and Dory represent two parts of myself. I didn't know where to begin, so like a good beginner, you start with yourself. I'm going to write a movie that's basically dividing up sections of me. O.C. is the artist that I've always wanted to be, the one that really believed in what he was saying. Maybe not that talented, but it didn't really matter. He believes it and is not a depressed guy. O.C. is the manic side of myself. I sit around for months waiting for 20 minutes where I can feel like OC and come up with kernels of ideas that I can spend years pursuing. That's who OC is. I definitely get that, and I relate to that as a creative person. I've come up with a lot of artistic ideas in the last, let's say, 15 years of my life, but there's a pretty big difference between the ones that have the magical energy of really good art and the ones that are just a cool piece made in some free time. That special feeling of inspiration is almost like a kind of spiritual possession that can come to you when you don't expect it. In addition to O.C., another great character Dory meets is Weird William, the boss of the janitorial business, a veteran, and a calming presence in the movie. When Weird William asks Dory why he smashed his coworker's phone and got himself fired, he says, Jesus told us to love our neighbors, right? Well, cell phones allow us to pick and choose our neighbor. It's dividing apart the brotherhood of man. There's no real sense of community anymore. <sighs> because of cell phones. <clears throat> what? I really wonder about this, and I wonder if it sheds light on a question I had watching the film. Okay, we meet Dory at the beginning and he's reading a Bible, but since he goes through so many more religions over the course of the film, are we supposed to think that he's just started being a Christian at the start of the film? Or had he been a Christian all his life up until he changes to being Jewish shortly after starting the janitor job? Or had he been sorta of Christian but not like really into it like he is in this film? Since in this clip we just saw, he's pretty clearly mangling and confusing anything resembling a Christian teaching, right? I mean, I don't know, I'm Jewish, you tell me. 
I mean, he can't argue that phones are making us further apart from each other just because he was annoyed by his coworker on her phone. She was very much communicating and having a personal connection with a friend or someone, so while she may not have been closer to Dory, she was obviously closer to someone. And also, what does it do to an office work environment for people to feel like their possessions could be destroyed by their coworkers at any moment? With his behavior being so misguided, Dory's not acting from any sort of solid spiritual understanding, but rather using spiritual language as a post hoc justification for lacking self-control. It would be like if someone got so mad at seeing animals at SeaWorld being held in captivity, so they stole the whales and brought them home to hang out in their living room. It's like, I get the justification, but it doesn't really fit with the action, really. David Russo said in the interview that Dory's obviously going through a Christian phase, and he believes that he needs to humble himself. Since Russo called it a Christian phase, that must pretty much answer the question for us, right? The movie is not him falling away from his Christian faith, but about him exploring faith in general, starting with his presumably native Christianity. Even though his faith in Christianity may not stay steady over the course of the weeks and months portrayed in the film, he gets closer and closer to what is for him a genuine spiritual approach to life, one that actually would allow him to exercise self-control. After trying on all the different religions he does, including nihilism, he figures out a bit better how he himself wants to live, what he wants to try to control, and what he wants to give up control control about. At another point in the interview, Russo talks about how producers said to him, you've got a Christian toilet film for intellectuals, there's no market for that. It's like fuck market, you perpetrate visions and that's a good way to go. And if that phrasing perpetrate visions sounds interesting to you, let's note that it also comes at another point in the interview when Russo's talking about the psychedelic visuals in the film. Because yes, this film is entirely psychedelic, and if none of the stuff I talk about sounds interesting to you, but you like psychedelic visuals, you should still watch the film. Russo said that inner visions are a regular part of human life, and the only difference between Joe Schmo having his visions and O.C. or Dory having their visions while they're pregnant is that they pay attention to them. O.C. perpetrates his visions. That's a really interesting phrasing, but I get it, and I like how it explains a way of controlling chaos or the process of taking ownership of something natural, of going from this is a phenomenon that's happening within me, internal visions, imagination, to I can do something with this. I can do this intentionally. The way Dory and the gang get into the Corsica cookies is that, well, they're hungry. While Dory's cleaning up in the offices of Corsica, he finds cookies in the trash and goes to eat them before getting caught by Tracy, a marketing executive at Corsica, played by the amazing Natasha Leon. <sighs> the goal is to develop a cookie that gives you the sensation of oven fresh warmth in every bite. You know, like your mother used to bake. My mom never used to make anything this weird. Those are just prototypes. She works on the team selling cookies and invites him to a focus group to test different cookie prototypes, and OC comes along because he has the hots for Tracy. Writer-director Russo was in the film, actually, in this scene. That's him testing the cookies. In the interview, he said his cameo was unintentional, because I was not dressed for it. I was wearing all red. I guess about half our, our extras didn't show up, so we were literally short on people. <laughs> That's a really funny situation. Well, he does a good job. Good job, David. Soon after Dory is cleaning up in a bathroom stall and finds a solid blue substance in a toilet that he thinks he sees moving, he calls OC and the crew to check it out and they all go to the stall in a scene that Russo said was shot almost completely out of focus and they were left trying to clip things together to make it work. But it does work well and despite Dory claiming he saw the thing move in the toilet, OC and the crew treat the blue thing in the toilet as just a very weird poop. OC explains that they've had other legendary weird poops before, like like one that was a pure white turd. I mean, a real contender. This is right up there with fluorescent peat and a pure white turd. Dory's in his post yamaka Jewish days soon enough when O.C. invites him to his band's show at a bar and Dory replies, I, I don't really want to listen to anything too um, blasphemous. <laughs> Get over yourself, chosen one.
An interesting detail is O.C.'s band is in fact named Pure White Turd, meaning he named his band after the legendary weird poop they found in the office building one time. I get two things out of this. First, that O.C.'s job really does mean a lot to him. His mythologizing to Dory about what it means to be a janitor was not just over-the-top self-expressing or showing off to the new guy, it was really a demonstration of how deeply he's inspired by his work. So much so that he names his band after a weird poop he found in a toilet at his job. Almost like being so inspired by your work as a janitor that you write and direct a feature film about janitors, eh David? And secondly, I like how the idea of a pure white turd is interesting because it's this transformation of one end of a duality into another, and the way this shocks our expectations and sensibilities. I'm not just trying to overthink a poop joke. This movie uses this idea twice specifically because it connects with the overarching message that the sacred and the profane, if you want to call it that, are two sides of the same cookie. The profane is just sort of the hook. This is why the writer-director gave interviews and spoke at events when it came out saying, Male miscarriage out the ass. It's about male miscarriage out the butt. But he clarifies that this sort of gross description is just one dimension. It's like I flippantly say, male miscarriage out the ass. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of doing that as just a hook. Right. When you get into the theater, there's, there's one thing I'm pretty sure the film does, mm -hmm. is it really pulls you in mm -hmm. and doesn't make fun of it. The movie goes deeply into touching and genuine territory because the men who give birth find it a very powerful experience. In fact, one article reports that Russo was inspired to write the whole script when working as a janitor and finding a miscarriage in a bathroom toilet. He wondered, what if this happened to men? Well, it would be an extremely hard experience for men too, obviously, and a deeply personal one. So much so that they hardly harbor any resentment against a company that knowingly left out cookies to test on them without informed consent for this little experiment, but we will get to that. The scene we just saw where O.C.'s inviting Dory to his band's show happens the morning after a fun night the janitor crew has on the roof on July 4th. They get drunk, eat cookies, and watch the fireworks. The trippy fireworks are the first sign that the janitors might be having some cookie side effects, because uh, they seem a little too trippy, those fireworks. The second sign is the digestive pains, which O.C. especially is dealing with the next morning, but he still delivers is one of my favorite lines. God, I could use a cookie omelet. This shows how they haven't even begun to connect the dots between the cookies and their symptoms. When they all leave after the long night, they're clearly leaving too late, and it's as the employees of the office building are walking in. Seems like OC and the gang don't care so much about being invisible to the office workers anymore. Maybe they're just too delirious from the long night and the cookie hangover, but their first priority of being invisible just doesn't hold the same weight now. Being invisible was a value based on meeting the socially constructed needs of the world, symbolized by the sensibilities of the people who work in the office building. It could be that invisible was meant to have the larger meaning that they were in a sense in a lower and less visible class compared to the office workers. Dory is a renter who's in debt, OC is a kooky artist, Methyl and Ethel are addicted to drugs we later find out. All of them are people who society is not built around supporting, they're all janitors too too, working for what we can assume is at best an okay wage, and even the boss of the company, Weird William, is a veteran, not the most visible group in our society. About this point, Russo said in the interview, I wrote this two months before the second Gulf War started, so I knew we were going to war again and it was an interesting time to write a script about marginalized people. They're all people who might often be treated like outcasts, or would at least have reason to expect to feel that way in many situations, but part of their transcending with the cookies and with this whole experience they have of getting pregnant seems to be them transcending the limits of this underclass and becoming visible. A question that lingers in the film is what is a healthy way to react to fate and the uncontrollable, especially what is a healthy way to react to the place in society you find yourself? Dory's spiritual journey takes its next stop at Buddhism, and we could say it's interesting that he gets into it in the lamest way possible by reading a Four Dummies brand book about it, but I guess I've never really read those books, so I don't know. I'm sure they have relatively okay information about the subject, but I can't help thinking that picking up almost any other book about Buddhism would be an improvement. But he's not just reading Buddhism for dummies, he's reading Buddhism for dummies at OC's band performance, The Pure White Turd Show. <laughs> Yeah! 
which OC also successfully invited Tracy from Corsica to. It's absolutely wild to me that Tracy shows up. It's like surreal in a way the movie just kind of moves on from. I think intentionally. Is Tracy simply there because she's into OC, or is she there to observe whether he's having any negative reaction to the cookies she's testing on him for her client? We get majorly mixed messages, and I think the film does this on purpose. In some ways, she's flirty and playful with him. I can't believe you met him. Yeah. Hey, don't get too flattered. It was either this or nachos with a bunch of duds at Casa de Pepe. <laughs> Seriously. But a minute later, we hear O.C. say this line. You know, I'm not so sure how much I like you knowing all about my, uh, about your preferences, your habits. So apparently she's been grilling him about his preferences and habits, as if she's there in a professional capacity studying the subject who doesn't know she's been leaving out cookies intentionally for him and his janitor friends. Tracy talks at the bar about how easy it is to effectively market to O.C.'s demographic. Your demographic isn't so complex. You're all about sex, power, prowess, money, mommy, sex, sex, sex. That's an interesting line that we'll come back to, but she seems to like OC somewhat, right? I mean, I think some signs are there. There's a fascinating little tidbit from the Russo interview where he says this about the actor playing Tracy. Natasha Lyonne, who is probably one of the smartest people I think I've ever met, she's a devastatingly intelligent person. I had a little bit of a tough time controlling her. She wanted to do a certain character a certain way that I didn't quite agree with, and there was just no turning her around. But once she got into the filming, she realized that she she had taken a wrong turn and she pried all the direction out of me that she was kind of ignoring and I think saved her performance. This is such an interesting quote to me, and he's vague and diplomatic enough that it's not even clear what he's referring to if he's referring to her choices about her own character or another character. I really want to speculate about this though, but take it with a pregnancy cravings worth of salt. My guess is that Natasha's decision was about her own character, since that would make the most sense, right? But uh, that's just my guess. And I'm guessing that she wanted Tracy to be, I want to say, more cynical and cutthroat, rather than vulnerable and relatable. Again, I'm making this up, and maybe it's the other way around, but either way, this seems like the axis that her character vacillates on. I have no idea. What do you think, though? What do you think the disagreement was here? Her relationship with OC doesn't feel real, honestly, and it doesn't make a ton of sense in the film. It feels kind of forced. Or maybe they're just both really lonely, but I'm guessing she started by either wanting Tracy to be really attracted to OC, or wanting her to not be attracted at all, but only motivated by her job, needing her to supervise his response to the cookies. I really don't know. This is all a guess. But after I struggled to understand Tracy's motivations, I found it fascinating that the writer-director and her had a hard time agreeing on something. Back at Corsica's offices, Methyl is inhaling special cookies and has the first big psychedelic freak out of the film. But when we cut back to the bar where OC is getting close to Tracy and Dory is just vibing, we see that Methyl isn't the only one hallucinating. Dory has a beautiful psychedelic trip, an experience that's so fun to watch that we almost forget it's probably not good that our beloved protagonist is experiencing this right now. Ethel comes to the bar and asks OC to come back to work on his night off. Methyl's sick. You have to help me tonight. O.C. says no, so Dory goes, and after O.C. makes him feel bad for being all tripped out while O.C.'s on a date with Tracy, Dory says I'm sorry as he leaves, which is manifested as a ring of golden light that hangs in the air. O.C. now sees this and interacts with it, though there hadn't been any indication that he was tripping or having hallucinations before. So this evening marks the point where they are all now experiencing the full hallucinatory effects of the cookies. It was slightly there with the fireworks, and now it's very much there with methyl having the first bad freak out because he housed some extra cookies this evening back at Corsica, but we'll see that their hallucinations sort of come in and out as well. At the end of the night, OC tries to invite Tracy back to his place, and she says no. She might be slightly into him, but not wanting to immediately go back to his place. When he goes on and keeps asking in different ways, she calls him a weasel, and we get a new iteration of the earlier line as OC responds. <laughs> I prefer artists, but whatever. Again, broadening the term artist artist in a less flattering way than before, of course, but still to the same effect of sort of merging art with life. Then OC's digestive system flares up and he collapses. Back at Corsica, Ethel shows Dory how the boss's office has a bunch of, let's say, adult videotapes to remain, uh, you know, 
monetizable on YouTube, and she puts in a tape which grosses out Dory and he leaves until she offers him cookies, calling him back into the office. It's very messed up how she coerces him like this. It's also interesting that she does because it means she perfectly well understands the fact that he's addicted to the cookies. Because while the men have talked about how much they love the cookies, like the amazing I could use a cookie omelet line, they haven't seemed self-aware about the dependence they have. If they were, Methyl would have realized he wasn't just sick but would have told Ethel to tell the guys cookie dependency made him freak out. I was wondering if Ethel coercing Dory like this comes from her own moral compass being messed up by the cookies, but there were lines between Tracy and her boss earlier about how the cookies only cause digestive issues for men, implying to me they very well might only be addictive to men and only cause hallucinations for men as well, and only men get pregnant from them. We later learn that she's been in active addiction, so it's possible that this messed with her moral compass. Either way, what she's doing is obviously wrong. When Dory says, what about methyl, Ethel says, Daryl's not here. Very interesting that this is the only time he's called Daryl, since the only reason I could see for her not wanting to call him Methyl while cheating on him is that it's a pet name for him, but then we've only known him by his pet name. I mean, it doesn't really matter, it's just interesting that OC seems to go by a nickname, Methyl goes by a nickname, Weird William goes by a nickname. This just adds to the feeling of their little janitorial world being separated from the boring daily grind of day jobs and birth names. Personally, I was wondering whether Dory's name was a reference to the fish from Finding Nemo, since it evokes a sense of journey and it would make some sense since Finding Nemo came out in 2003, which is when Russo started working on the film. Anyway, after being coerced into that situation with Methyl, we see Dory yelling curses not just because he feels bad about being physically intimate with someone in a relationship, but because his complicated religiosity has him feeling bad about being physically intimate at all. Drunkenness, gluttony, fornication, sodomy. So his religiosity takes another twist, and he's into Islam now. There's a joke where OC tells him which way Mecca is while he's praying, and he adjusts his prayer rug, and I just mention it because it's the analog of the bit of him reading Buddhism for dummies. As we see Dory considering various religions, the limited depth of his approach to them shows how each religion is just a stop on his journey, but nothing close to the destination for him. He's easily getting into it with a bunch of ignorance, and he'll easily get out of it with a bunch of ignorance, or maybe slightly less. O.C. tells Dory not to feel bad about what happened with Ethel. Believe me, she ain't sweating this, so neither should you. This is natural. This is nature. Hooray. This is what fucking animals do, man. Uh. Celebrate. Not the most helpful advice, but on brand for OC. I want to mention that I think, by the way, it's a bit weird how this movie has the trope of a sort of evil seductress. It could be to mimic a sort of holy parable about the protagonist succumbing to temptation and so on, but we have few women in the film, and one of them, Tracy, has the idea to test experimental cookies on the guys without their consent, and the other woman, Methyl, coerces Dory with the cookies in a pretty evil way. The cookies seems to be like the apple in the Garden of Eden that the old stories blame Eve for taking first and then sharing with Adam. Blaming women for things is a classic religious pastime, so we could see this movie as doing a sort of meta-commentary on its subject matter, or just as the same trope itself. I don't know. What do you think? Ethel is a very confusing character to me, and I feel like the film sort of tries to keep her out of the film because it doesn't know what to do with her and how much of which qualities to give her. Then OC goes to open mail, predicts it's going to be another art school rejection, as he says, and then he opens it and it's a check from something called Artist Tree for $8,500, a blessing from fate, presumably a sponsorship from a foundation for him to go do art. There's a telling line where he says this, Baby, I ain't sloppin' shit. Even if he was really able to gain inspiration from his job, it was not something he actually wanted to spend his time doing, obviously, or it was not his first priority. Interestingly, the writer-director Russo began working to make his Dizzle script into a film when he himself was awarded a grant. OC shows us one way to react when fate gives a gift. Dive in head first, which we'll get to. I love the pacing of the film and how it manages interweaving different side plots. It does it really well. Dory goes to the doctor for the cramps and the hallucinations, and the doctor warns him that testing procedures could be expensive since Dory doesn't have insurance. The doctor asks Dory if he does any drugs, to which Dory responds, just cookies, cookies that make him feel good. This leads to another priceless, priceless moment. <laughs> 
do you think maybe you're eating too many cookies? Feels like I'm not eating enough. I got a joke for you. Guy walks into an emergency room. He says, doctor, it hurts when I eat too many cookies. And the doctor says, what? Comedy gold. And here he's being confronted, an intervention is being attempted, but his self-awareness just isn't there. The doctor tells him to eat less cookies, and the appointment costs him over $1,000. Since I guess this movie is from 2009, and you used to actually be able to find out how much an appointment would cost on the date of service. But anyway, they don't offer him financial aid, just a payment plan and a call service, and he gets justifiably mad. He grabs that candy because, I guess, of his cravings that he's starting to have. He begins to study Hare Krishna. Krishna spirituality, and before long, Methel comes and beats him up for hooking up with Ethel. Dory doesn't fight back or run away, he just covers his head, and they both seem to be tripping out now a little bit. Dory yells, I'm sorry, as Methel leaves, the first return of the movie's refrain from before when Dory left the golden I'm sorry hanging in the air in O.C.'s vision. We'll see more soon, and we'll talk about what I'm sorry means to the film. After the fight, Dory starts drinking salt, a pregnancy craving. Then the most psychedelic scene of the movie happens as he takes a hot shower and whatever is going on gets to a peak intensity. He starts seeing lists of ingredients on the walls, the components of the chemicals in the cookies, I assume, projected out of his eyeballs onto the walls and melting. It gets so bad that Dory realizes the cookies are causing it and he goes to an art show OC's putting on where Tracy is and they're now kissing and I thought this was a dream sequence at first because it comes right after Dory's hallucinations, but this is real life actually, and he tells OC that the cookies are causing issues. Hey, Dory, we gotta get Whoa. these out of here. What the hell happened to you? There's something seriously wrong with these cookies. Do you need help, Oliver? Wow, I cannot believe I missed this. And it took until editing the video to notice she calls him Oliver. So just like Ethel called Methyl Daryl when she was cheating on him, Tracy is now calling OC Oliver. Why? Is it related to her explicitly right now serving the function of sort of diffusing Dory's suspicion about her company's product? Why are women in this film given this function of transforming men's identities by calling them a different name? What are we supposed to take from that? That's an interesting detail that she calls him Oliver here. This is weeks later, actually, and OC doesn't work as a janitor anymore, and his first art project with his new chunk of cash is coats for houseless people that say, I'm sorry on the back. See what David Russo meant by OC perpetrating his visions? So the I'm sorry refrain comes back here in a twisted art project making houseless people apologize for existing, or as OC puts it, Because somebody has to do the apologizing for all of us. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. how do you serve mankind? And Dory interrupts, justifiably getting furious and yelling. So, but the I'm sorry thing is interesting because it's something that the film works to broaden our understanding of. The director said this at the time. I want to say, because I have no control, I want to say I'm sorry. So, so contrition is your gateway to spirituality. There's nothing that will be healthier for you as a human being than to be able to say I'm sorry and mean it. We all have things to apologize for, uh, whether we're directly related to the events or not. I mean, there's a f***ing like, oil spill in the Gulf, and we're not out on the streets. You know, we're, it, we're just completely culpable here. So, so the best we can do is say I'm sorry. Interesting point, and certainly a fair suggestion that we broaden the range of what we take responsibility for, not to erase the culpability of corporations and politicians and so on, but just to avoid limiting our scope of what we think we can do with our actions. The film broadens the scope of I'm sorry, just like it broadens the scope of the meaning of artist. O.C. got the I'm sorry thing from that sorry bubble Dory left at the bar, of course, but he calls what he saw a vision, and when Dory calls them hallucinations, he says, Hallucinations! <laughs> you are so seriously pissing on my cheese, man. Dory has put it all together, the digestive issues and the hallucinations, and says he thinks they're both about to give birth to the blue thing he found in the toilet way back when. He's now isolated at work. Methyl and Ethel are still together, and they both treat him badly. He eats cookies to feel okay, and then buys Pepto-Bismol to deal with the consequences. This video is not sponsored by Pepto-Bismol. He calls the free phone service he got the card for at the doctor, and it's literally 
essentially an automated voice. Society is failing him. He's uninsured and even the free service he has access to is not good. The boss at Corsica walks in on him, and this is in the nighttime when the boss is not supposed to be there. And maybe now's a good time to mention that on July 4th, when they were there at work, uh, there's a shot of this Corsica boss watching them from an upper level of the building at night. It's interesting that he seems to have made a habit of staying at work to observe the unwitting test subjects because I guess if he didn't do that and if Tracy didn't hitch up with OC, how would they even know what's going on? But don't get me wrong, Tracy definitely seems to like OC by this point, I mean we saw them kissing, and now that I think about it, the boss actually might never have been there to observe them at all. The boss doesn't seem to take any notice of Dory when Dory says he feels really unwell and when this is visibly clear. If the boss cared about observing his unwitting experimental subjects, I think he would ask more questions about why and how Dory feels bad even for non-empathetic reasons. We'll talk soon about why exactly the boss is there, but yeah, I'm not sure if the movie really made up its mind about how much the boss and Tracy actually care about observing their subjects because we almost never really see them caring that much about observing the unwitting test subjects, so yeah. Anyway, so Dory gives birth, and it's a blue fish-like creature, and since that's what he was predicting, he's not really surprised. Instead, he's just a bit sad when it hops down a drain. He calls OC and they meet up. There's a line that refers back to the conversation at the Pure White Turd show where Tracy said it was easy to effectively market to people. Jesus Christ! Tracy's right, man. We do not stand a chance against product research. These are terrific. It's interesting that Tracy seems to be this force of, like, capitalist realism here or something, but so is OC if we remember what he said on July 4th about being an artist. Becoming a great artist is all about raw marketing. Talent don't mean shit. Okay. OC asks if Dory has any cookies, and Dory says no, they haven't had them for weeks at the offices, which is part of what makes him think there's something wrong, in addition, of course, to the fact that he just gave birth to a fish out of his butt. Tracy clearly told her boss when Dory came to the toilet art show and warned about the cookies weeks before. Maybe that's why the boss didn't care about Dory being unwell, since he already knew the cookies had negatively affected the unwitting test subjects. Then there's a scene where the boss has Tracy sign a non-disclosure agreement, and we learn it's because a university report came back about the chemicals involved in the cookies. Tracy clearly feels bad since she cares about OC and asks to see the report before signing the NDA. But she doesn't see the report and she signs the NDA, then learns from the boss that the chemical in the cookie prototypes is this big scientific breakthrough that creates a semi-animate mound in people's digestive tracts. The boss gets revved up about it as a potential future business opportunity and Tracy leaves. She leaves to be with OC, we'll see in a second. Dory visits O.C., who's just given birth, and who is mourning that the living creature he gave birth to did not survive. This is not played for jokes. This is a tender moment, and he's really sad and disturbed. Not that never even had a chance. Just fucking sad. He flushes it to not let Dory capture it to use as evidence in suing Corsica. Then, as they talk about visiting Methyl and Ethel to get the fishes when they give birth, Tracy lets it slip that Ethel's not in danger since it doesn't affect women this way. The guys obviously get angry and confront Tracy for knowing about this, and this leads to OC asking her directly, What the fuck is going on? I don't know as much as you think, alright? That's what's so silly about this. I mean, no one really knows. But it has to do with those evil cookies, though, doesn't it? I, I just can't talk about this. He then asks how much she cares about him. She hesitates, and she goes on to say, I just, I can't do this, all right? I love my job. Can you even understand that? No, I can't understand that actually, Tracy, since you just ran away from your boss maniacally going on about the business prospects of the substance you surreptitiously fed to these guys. She ran away from her boss because she has a conscience, but she loves her job enough to kind of stay there with no issue. And she doesn't really take accountability or apologize, and she also gets exactly what she wants here as far as the rest of the movie's plot is concerned. She has her cake and eats it, and here she says it's all over with, meaning the situation with the bluefish, which I guess she's confident will have no lingering issues for OC. And she leaves them there. I love how this movie blends serious kind of tragic scenes with comedy. Hey, we gotta get to Methyl. Tonight. Dude, I think I gotta break up with her. They find Methyl and they sell him on the idea of filming his delivery. He's an easy sell. <sighs> I could send a copy of it to Howard Stern. 
<laughs> I bet I could even get Ethel back. Then O.C. talks for a bit about how it's affected him. Their pregnancies brought them fulfillment, something like what Dory's been looking for on his spiritual journey. This is why in interviews at the time, the director David Russo made it clear that the whole male miscarriage out the butt thing, as he called it, was just the hook, not the whole point. And to make that make sense. It's just fun to say. And that, exactly. <laughs> male miscarriage out the ass. Put it on the goddamn poster. That was my advice to everybody. Uh, but uh, uh, making that work, and I'm worried that when people do hear things like I flippantly say, male miscarriage out the ass, I'm kind of doing that as just a hook. When you get into the theater, there's, there's one thing I'm pretty sure the film does, is it really pulls you in and doesn't make fun of it. That's absolutely true, and it wouldn't have been nearly as good or meaningful of a movie without this twist that the men have a bond with the creatures they give birth to. It actually would have probably been a really bad movie. Why make fun of these men for going through this? They literally got addicted to an unknown substance without giving consent to partaking in an extended experimental trial, and they conceived a sort of offspring against their will, went through significant pain, and felt connected to the creature that came out of them, only to be unable to take care of it. It's sad what they're going through. It really is. They talk about what it could mean. What kind of message do you take from a fluorescent blue fish conceived from industrial cookies born out of the asses of men? And all we get as a response from Dory here is all we can get, which is... I don't know. It's just such a raw animal experience that it would seem impossible to chain to a single symbol. I like to think of the fish as symbols of fulfillment since they seem to bring a sense of centeredness to these guys, but they are in reality empty of meaning. They're fish. They're not ideas. Which brings us to the third birth, Methyls. His little baby bluefish squirts out and seems to have not just sentience but amazing intelligence as it bounds quickly directly for the bathroom as if to find a drain. They catch it and put it in a bag and Methyl has a special bond with his fish, naming it Little Dizzle, like from the title. When Dory and O.C. experienced now as they are tell Methyl that Dizzle doesn't have a mouth or nose so it can't breathe and it'll die, it's an intense moment. What? I'm sorry, buddy, but little guy doesn't have long for this world, man. No. It's absurd, but it isn't played for laughs. It's played instead for Dory teaching Methyl how to pray. When Methyl says he can't pray, Dory asks what his mother's religion was, since Dory is a Swiss army knife of religions. Catholic? Okay. Dory had been trying to apologize to Methyl, but hadn't gotten through, and finally they can have some sense of relationship again brought together by this experience. But Methyl runs off with Dizzle to show it to Ethel at somebody's house. We get a classic window scene, but instead of him playing a boombox, he pulls out little Dizzle in a plastic bag and explains to Ethel he just gave birth. She's like, what? And then they move on to talking about why she left him. Turns out Ethel left him not because he was acting insane as he was addicted to cookies, but because her family had an intervention for her and she was staying at her brother's and not supposed to spend time with him. My brother Jason organized one of those interventions for me. I'm detoxing right now. He wants me here. But I'm not supposed to see you at all. That's part of it. They connect and this scene made me tear up, honestly. Ethel? I love you. What the fuck are you talking about? I really do. I love you. Shut up. You act like such a freak sometimes. Just quit it. I know. I know. It, uh... I'm sorry. You forgive me? Go home. Please? <laughs> Whatever. Go home. Go home. What's great about it is that he barely, barely said anything about Dizzle to her. Dizzle is what gives him the confidence to go over there and tell her he loves her, and he sort of confusingly thinks that she'll want to be with him again when she sees Dizzle, 
But really, it turns out she does seem to love him, but it obviously has nothing to do with Dizzle. In my weird brain, this reminded me of the classic Space Jam magic water bottle trope, where it's, it was just plain water all along, but here instead it's like, it was never about Dizzle all along, or Dizzle was inside of us all along, or Dizzle was the friends we made along the way, I don't know. Sadly, by the end of the scene, Dizzle has gone to a better place. Dizzle's gone, but in its place is his love with Ethel, who I hope eventually apologized off-screen to Dory for coercing him with addictive cookies. When they go to Dory's doctor to show him the video of the birthing, and the doctor just cracks up and doesn't believe them, Dory and O.C. leave. Then we get an important line thematically. You know what? To hell with the bright side. Fuck it! I'm a chump for trying to see a little justice in this cruel fucking world! Get off. I'm going back to work. It's the rock bottom loss of faith moment, and this leads to him formulating a plan. He goes into the Corsica offices and prints off stuff from their computer, and even better, he uses the skills from his first job he was at at the beginning of the movie, calling himself the Data Meister again like he did at the beginning before getting himself fired. This integration of his previous self with his further along the journey self is an important element to this climax of the film. It shows he's creating a new identity not just by fighting his previous ones, but by integrating and synthesizing with his previous ones. He sees the phrase semi-aggregate intestinal fauna in the documents, the acronym SAIF that the boss came up with because it spells safe. Semi-aggregate intestinal fauna? Semi-aggregate intestinal fauna. Semi-aggregate intestinal fauna. What kind of a world do you think we're living in? He has a true moment of questioning. Is this what God made us for? I knew more creative ways to exploit one another? We see him feverishly repeating a speech in different contexts and finally knocking on the door of the boss of Corsica. He's there to show that he has the proof of what they did, but first he throws open the bureau to reveal all the explicit videos the boss kept in there, and that turns out to be a dream sequence. But the more interesting thing about this is that right in this sequence, we flash back to when he smashed his coworker's phone at the beginning. So we're having these two situations being equated. And the movie is telling us that he's thinking about, well, I acted up at my old job and that wasn't right, should I really act up here? And then as the real scene of him confronting the boss plays out, we see instead his silence. Garbage already. There you go, partner. How you doing? He flashes back to the scene of cleaning up his blue birthed creature while wearing a God is dead shirt since that was the last iteration in his spiritual journey. And as we come back to the present moment, he decides not to confront the boss and Tracy. And he decides apparently not to like sue them or whatever. This is framed I think as the mature or serene and spiritual thing for him to do, to avoid getting wrapped up more in affairs of BS or whatever. And clearly we're made to feel that his memory of his intimate birth and loss of the creature he birthed made him feel something that made him change his mind about confronting the company, starting a lawsuit, and so on. Terrific. Sorry for interrupting. This is such an interesting and sort of anticlimactic moment in the film. Dory gives up his power and leverage, and he chooses to remain seen simply as a janitor instead of as an injured party in a potentially huge and justified lawsuit. He chooses wise silence instead of brash action, and if we replay that memory sequence he has right after the dream sequence of brash action, we see that before he reflects on the loss of his blue fish, he has this memory sequence where he remembers him smashing his coworker's phone, as I said, and then also him hooking up with Ethel and the fireworks and more. Why do these memories take the luster out of that first fantasy he had about actually confronting them? The memories do what? They teach him how far he's come? Remind him of the important parts of life, human connection, and new experiences? And so all this saps his desire to hold the people who used him accountable? I talked about this scene with a family member who I originally watched the movie with years ago when it was still on Netflix, like for a year or something, and my family member made the point that Dory doesn't want to exploit his experience with the blue fish and OC and all that, that Dory decides not to pursue legal action or hold them accountable because it's what feels most respectful to his experience. I think that makes a lot of sense, but it was interesting re-watching the film, not remembering that he makes this decision at the end, and actually I was almost a little disappointed at first. But as I reflected on it more, I understand that this was his 
his way of finding peace. He throws the evidence of what happened in the trash, and we see billboards advertising the cookies, which are now being sold publicly. We see Ethel getting a truck driver's certification, and she's back together with Methyl, who works at a junkyard. O.C. is an artist, painting, and with Tracy still, and friends with Methyl. It's a bit too much happening at the end, in my opinion. It's kind of a clumsy wrap-up, but, I mean, it's better than text on the screen telling you what they did. Uh, so the important thing is that the characters have improved their lives and they're happier. We see Dory's stolen files at the junkyard, actually, but that doesn't seem to serve any function at all in the movie and feels unnecessary. It's probably meant to imply that the documents could potentially be discovered one day, I guess, because otherwise it's just, hey, look, uh, Dory threw them away and they happen to go to this exact same junkyard where methyl works. What a coincidence. It's supposed to make us think, will anyone discover that? Well, back at Corsica, we get this last shot of the boss getting himself off at night to his explicit VHS material uh, in his office, which explains why he was there late at night those times, I, I guess. I mean, it does. But it also is meant to, I think, show him hiding from his conscience in a way. That's how it seems to me, at least. Like, what kind of life do you live where you stay at work to do such an intimate thing? It's sick and twisted, and it shows that a bad conscience manifests somehow. Then Dory throws his own message in a bottle into the ocean, bringing the movie full circle, and as he's looking in, he sees what appears to be a school of dizzles, bringing a smile to his face that I found really moving. It makes sense because he lost his dizzle down the drain in the bathroom, so it technically could have escaped. This is if we're using the Finding Nemo logic of All drains lead to the ocean. Which is funny because, like I said, I feel like the name Dory was inspired by Finding Nemo. <laughs> I mean, we, we have blue fish, too, in this film, so Dory, come on. I mean, we then see a young boy finding the bottle, and the message inside was not the same as the fuck you in the one that Dory found. Instead of a mean, sort of nihilistic message, guess what Dory wrote in his bottle? He wrote, I'm sorry, of course, bringing the I'm sorry theme full circle. And since a message in a bottle seems like a message from the deep blue, and from the universe itself, I'm sorry, it is such a strikingly different message. While the universe might not care about us, there's no reason for it to be mean about it. It can at least apologize for not caring. This is similar, but not the exact same as how Russo thought about the message in a bottle. The message Dory gets in the beginning is f you. Uh, and, and I don't want to be the generation that says f you to the next generation. I want to say, because I have no control, I want to say I'm sorry. And this is the same place he said the stuff about contrition that we mentioned earlier. So, so contrition is your gateway to spirituality. There's nothing that will be healthier for you as a human being than to be able to say I'm sorry and mean it. We all have things to apologize for. So he saw the message in a bottle more as an apology from the past rather than an apology from the universe, but I think that's a fine line and pretty similar if you think about how little control we have over both. And then there's a surprise at the end. We see the boss of the janitor business, the cool veteran Weird William, and he's kept his own dizzle he birthed alive. The movie says, hey, you thought we forgot about Weird William? Nope. He gets a dizzle, and you get a dizzle, and you get a dizzle. I don't know how he kept it alive. Whatever. The movie brought us with Dory to a place of losing faith, but it brings us back to hope and life. And that's pretty much it. What else is there to say? Oh, well, one funny thing. I didn't know where else I could put this. In an interview, the actor Ty Runyon, who played methyl talked about practicing his primal scream for his birthing scene with the director and they were in some rented space and had this happen and so we were both in there screaming like writhing <laughs> and uh, i got a knock on the door and um a therapist had just moved in to the office next door and was in session with a client and meanwhile we're doing like primal scream <laughs> kind of stuff next door. I just wanted to mention that funny point because this is a therapy channel after all. Another final thing I'll say is that the editing was extremely good in this movie. In a great interview, David talks about working in collaboration with others, making compromises, and in particular working closely with the editor of this film. My editor, you know, creatively saved me from myself in places. You know, he, I defer and compromise with his judgment more than I ever thought I would, and I am so happy I did. 
it mm -hmm. because the project is so much better for his. This is Billy McMillan, by the way. Uh, so check out some of my favorite editing bits. There's this scene towards the beginning where he's given the card to go apply to the janitor job and it's intercut with shots of a televangelist he's watching. Or the part where OC is describing the office and we're seeing shots of it cut in. There's unique surreal moments like this double face bit. And there's this really well done part where Methyl and Ethel are enjoying each other's company, we could say, in the same space that they're cleaning for the next morning's meetings and we see it all sped up at once. And the psychedelic editing is amazing. I mean, the fireworks scene, for instance, but the shower scene, of course, as well. In this one scene, the editing plays a little joke, I think, and I wanted to point this out. In the scene after Dory's shower trip out where we see the art show OC is putting on and it's all about toilets. So all his art is about toilets, right? It's pretty normal for OC the janitor. For instance, there's toilet paper with wipe written on it. But the funny thing is that then there are these fast transitions, but if you notice what type of transition it is, it's a wipe transition. I have no idea if this was done on purpose, but I noticed it and I had to point it out. A wipe for the wipe. It goes on for the whole scene too, wipes everywhere. Well, speaking of wiping, I think we're finished here with this video. Maybe we should uh, wipe and flush the video. Thanks for watching. I know it seems like I completely overanalyzed this movie and if you hadn't already seen it, it would be totally not worth seeing now, but I swear that is not at all true. There are so many funny moments I couldn't even begin to mention. So many worthwhile psychedelic visuals, amazing acting, definitely check it out. Please feel free to like and subscribe to my channel. Check out the other videos on this channel. We got other ones about movies or other media. We got mental health stuff, philosophy stuff, politics, all that good stuff. There's also a bunch of extra content videos and music on Patreon if you want to pay a dollar or four dollars or something and you can go there and support these videos uh, if you want to. If you like hanging out on the website Twitch, I stream there a few times a week and play chess and hang out so feel free to stop by. And I want to end by thanking the amazing people currently supporting these videos. Thank you so much to Put My Name in the Credits Winky Face, Elise, a cool anonymous person, and a dope anonymous person. Thanks y'all for supporting the stuff I make, it's extremely appreciated. I'm going to keep making stuff, so stay tuned and have a good new year everybody if you celebrate time passing in that way. Alright, bye. Slay. 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 Slay, 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 slay,